Hi, this is Mark Arnold with yet another episode of Fun Ideas Podcast, and today I have a special guest. Her name is Lori Kay, and she's worked in the radio industry and also has written a brand new book about John Lennon and Yoko Ono. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. So I want to say that it's an honor (laughs) talking to you because I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and KFRC was my radio station during the 70s and 80s, so I knew your name. I didn't necessarily know your face, but, you know, I, I just want to say this, that, you know, I'm one of the few collectors. While everybody else was getting Slurpee cups with Marvel superheroes, I was getting the Big Ten, Big 610 team cups, and I still have them with Dr. John Rose and Marvelous Mark and <laughs> all the others. So. They were the greatest. Yes, yes. And if memory serves, you didn't get your own cup. Well, <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't have a cup. I was a newscaster, not a DJ. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess that was the rule. I didn't even know. I just knew, oh, radio personalities that, you know, I didn't know, you know, if they distinguish who was who and blah, 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 blah. But, yeah, that was big at the time. And I didn't realize it, you know, it's like looking back on it, how big that station was and, you know, the stuff you produced, you know, the radio shows and series and things like that. So it was so much fun to be there and be able to do interviews and rock specials and <laughs> producing and 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 short even news pieces with with rock stars that sort of thing it was great Mm -hmm. so moving backwards a little bit uh tell me a little bit about yourself and you know what led to the events that got you to work at kfrc and work in radio and things like that well i'm a socal gal an la native who was raised by a dysfunctional family and was a teenage runaway. Mm -hmm. And um, radio was very important in my life to me from the time I was a toddler. I had, you know, my own little tiny radio with with earplugs that I would listen to all night. Um, The RKO station at the time, which was KHJ, was my favorite (laughs) here in LA. And so that's why it was so very exciting for me to be eventually get to be on KFRC because it was the sister station, basically. And the way I was able to do that was because after um, going to college at UCSC, Santa Cruz, um, and moving to Bali in Indonesia to study Balinese <laughs> dance, I um, I ended up um, going to journalism school at uh, UC Berkeley. And after I was there for not even a full quarter, um, one of my professors, teachers said to me, what are you doing in this class, Lori? You already know how to write. You should get an internship and get a job. You don't need the school. And I said, okay, great. And I went to go look in the in the journalism department on the bulletin board to see what um, internships there were. And there were literally no newspapers looking because it was very last minute. But KFRC was looking for their very first news department uh, intern. And so I applied, got it, ended up getting a job from it. So I was able to quit school. And the minute I got the job, since I was already at it as an intern, I'd already done a couple of specials um, that were um, very popular. They weren't rock related, but they had music in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, one was called um, <laughs> The Bay Area's Fight Against Fat. And I used all kinds of great songs in it, along with interviews. Um, and uh, one of the the best songs in it was John Lennon's version of Boney Maroney. Oh, yeah. <laughs> his rock and roll album. And so that was really cool for me. And um, it uh, what it did was um, allow me to get the job to write and co-produce what turned out to be RKO Presents the Beatles, the Beatles from Liverpool to Legend, mm-hmm. which was America's longest Beatles special. Originally 14 hours, we eventually expanded it to 17 and mm-hmm. it got syndicated. And um, so that was very exciting. And that led to everything from being able to fly to London to interview Paul and Linda McCartney and uh, and the latest lineup of Wings to eventually the incredible John Lennon and Yoko Ono interview, which of course tragically turned out to be on his last day on the planet. Right. Um, backing up a little bit, um, the uh, 
Beatles special is one of my favorites and I taped it off the air or my mom did, I guess I was pretty young, <laughs> but uh, I listened to that thing over and over and over and just thought this is like one of the best produced radio specials I've ever heard, at least up to that point, you know, and, you know, to this day, I, you know, there are interviews in, of uh, from like Mal Evans and people like that, that I've never heard before or since on other you know, like the Beatles anthology didn't have any of these interview bits and stuff like that. It's like, where did you find these things in the day just before the internet? And <laughs> Well, it was very cool because when I got the job at KFRC after the internship, mm-hmm. um, Dave Sholin, who was the music director at the time, uh, came in and said, so Lori, you're from Los Angeles. Next time you go back to town there, can you do me a favor? Mm-hmm. And I said, sure, what? And he said, can you go to KHJ for me and and pick up a box of tapes? And I said, KHJ, my favorite station as a kid, (laughs) I'd love to. So I went that weekend, I picked up the box for him and it was not just original Beatles interviews from the Mm sixties, but also a lot of other type interviews, like uh, like you mentioned, uh, people related to the Beatles. And when I brought them back, I said to Dave, tell me, what is this for? And he said, (laughs) well, we're hoping to do a Beatles special. And I said, wow, that's so cool. And he turned to my news director, the incredible Joe Interante, who passed this year, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. and said, Joe, are you interested in writing this special? And she said, I'm a news director. I'm too busy and I have (laughs) kids to raise. She said, Lori's a great writer. Have Lori do it. And I I almost gasped. I mean, I had just turned 21 and it was like being asked to do the top RKO special was amazing. And Dave said, okay, Lori, how about it? And I said, yeah. (laughs) And um, it took me well over a year, you know, to, to all of us to, to produce it and, and get it done. And, and Ron Hummel, who was the um, engineer and technical producer and, and basically, taught me so much about radio production and and it was so much fun working with him the the thing was though my daytime job was full time in the news department so all night i stayed up and wrote the special and and thought about what i wanted to put in it and that kind of things and um that's one of the reasons why my book has so much in it uh, regarding um uh, sex and drugs and rock and roll yeah. because that's all part of, of what it was like to do that show it's mm-hmm. amazing and how long did it take you to write it uh, from the beginning um, to let's see we started the show in the fall of 77 no fall of 76 mm-hmm. and it was airing uh towards the end of 77 yep. so it, it took, my first show uh, over a year put the whole thing together and get it all approved by all the RKO executives who who loved it and sent us incredible notes and and calls about how great it was and that was wonderful it was the biggest compliments I've ever had in my life yeah one thing I found incredible because I've listened to it again in recent years after not listening because I almost had it memorized I listened to it so much when I was younger um but now with like the anthology and all this other information that's come out with like Mark Lewison's books and things like that, it's still incredibly factual and accurate. There's a couple little minor things that you probably wouldn't have known at the time because they weren't disclosed. But I mean, it's like it's amazing. It still holds up, you know. So I, I'm I'm really happy about it. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, I was able to do a lot of um, side interviews as well for the uh, for this special which was great um and the thing was i never considered myself a beatles expert i still <laughs> don't i mean i loved the beatles i knew a lot about their music and 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 each one of them and had seen them at dodger stadium in 1966 yeah, <laughs> but the thing is compared to the beatles book writers like um kenneth womack who knows everything about them (laughs) that that doesn't even compare to me i had to do a lot of research and a lot of reading before Mm -hmm. writing the special but he and the other authors that was their expertise you know they knew a lot about the beatles my expertise is i met them all yeah (laughs) and got to hang out with them so that was made it different and the cool thing about kenneth womack is he wrote the foreword for my book 
and mm -hmm. uh, and really liked it. So that was amazing. And uh, and all the authors that have interviewed me, including mm -hmm. Kenneth, um, it's just been wonderful to be attached to them. Mm -hmm. Now, I assume you're a first generation U.S. fan, so Ed Sullivan is probably your first exposure. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was amazing to see them on on Ed Sullivan show. And as I mentioned, I I grew up uh, raised by a dysfunctional family, so I was staying with um, uh, my mother's sister and and her family. And thank God they all wanted to watch Ed Sullivan because I don't think <laughs> my family would have let me. And um, and the Beatles were on, and it was like. Oh my God, I'm in love with them. And that was the start of it. It was it was all uphill from from then on. It was great. For me, I, I was born December 66, so they were already underway. And so um I knew of the Beatles, but uh, I didn't become a confirmed fan until around the time of that special. It was in 1977. Uh the new albums were like the Love Songs compilation and uh uh, there was a few other TV specials and things going around, and you know, I just got hooked. Um, I've told this story many times before, but I'll say it quickly now. Is I was already a Monty Python fan. Uh, Eric Idle was the host on Saturday Night Live. I was already a Saturday Night Live fan, and uh, I said, "What's the real?" He, he's saying, "Here comes the sun," really loud and obnoxiously. And I said, "What's the real song sound like?" And my dad says, oh, we got the album over there. It has the four guys walking across the street, you know. And I go, oh, okay. Abbey Road, you know, I didn't know what it was because it doesn't have the name on the cover. <laughs> anyway, but, you know, from then on, you know, long story short, I was hooked, you know, and I've been a Beatle fan ever since. So anything that came out, radio or TV or movies or whatever, I was there. So, you know, so I appreciate what you did. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. And one of the greatest things when you mentioned Abbey Road that made me think of this is, mm -hmm. is I got the chance to interview George Martin, producer, mm -hmm. um, when he came out with his book. And uh, that was really wonderful. And of course, he talked about Abbey Road and Let It Be, the last two albums. And mm -hmm. it was, it just made my heart just pump. It was so wonderful <laughs> to be able to speak with him. He was great. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned you met all four, obviously, John and Paul, you already said. Uh, what were the circumstances for George or Ringo? Well, actually, I didn't meet all four. Oh, I, I thought you said, said that. Sorry. <laughs> Ringo is the one Beatle that I never got to interview. It just never worked out schedule wise. Mm, still so have a chance, as, though. Yeah, at least. yeah I know. Yeah. It's, and the thing is, he's <laughs> local, too. So I'm oh. <laughs> hoping one day to run into him and say, mm -hmm. hey, let's do an interview. There's no yeah, more. The world, but let's just do <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, it was great to interview George. He was the very first mm -hmm. that I interviewed. And, um, and then Paul in London. Mm -hmm. And then um, John in yeah. uh, New York. What was the circumstances with George? Was it his Dark Horse tour or something else? Well, no, it was actually, I was doing another special for mm -hmm. uh, RKO and also a company called Drake Chenault was the uh, the co-producer and it was called Top 100 of the 70s. Mm -hmm. And George Harrison not only had a song that was going to be in that, but also we were doing the, um, the longer version of our Beatles special. Mm -hmm. So it was the opportunity to add more bites from George Harrison. And he was coming out with his new album he was mastering. Uh, that was uh, just George Harrison. Right, right. Was and, blow away, um, I think was it. <laughs> exactly. So uh, so that was very exciting to, to be able to do that with him. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, let me see. Let me forward a little bit to uh, the, the Lennon interview then. Um, the main question I have about it, I mean, it's, it, I know you didn't plan it to be the last interview, but um, were you aware of and or were you upset that others like Playboy and Rolling Stone and, uh, you know, BBC Radio and uh, Newsweek and all the other ones were doing interviews at the same time? Or did that concern you at all at that time? Well, there weren't that many interviews. That's the yeah. thing. It was a BBC interview. There was yeah. a Playboy interview. Um, there was a Rolling Stone interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, there had been one uh, New York radio interview prior to the album being released. But we were going to be the only radio team to interview John and Yoko 
following the release of the album. So it was uh-huh. extremely exciting. And as I mentioned in my book, which you haven't read, I'm guessing. Oh. Um, it's uh, not out yet. <laughs> it's not, but <laughs> I was hoping that uh, that you might want to request getting the um, the digital, the PDF press yeah. copy version from my publisher because I could have had that sent to you. Um, I should have done that. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> that's okay. But, but, um, but anyway, it was, it was still very exciting because um, we were told that the one thing we could not do was bring up the Beatles or bring up John's past, that huh. it was to talk about double fantasy, his future with Yoko and all of that. So that was very exciting. And that's why when I was on the flight to New York for the interview with Dave and Ron and uh, Bert Keen from the um, from the record company, um, I was reading the Playboy interview, which had just come out shortly before. And John was obviously pissed off at the writer because he had brought up the Beatles and all these other things. So I thought, Okay, be really careful. But that was the cool thing about the interview because John was the one who brought up Paul, right. and the Beatles, and uh, and the past, and right. uh, it was really great. And I should mention that my book title is "Confessions of a Rock and Roll Name Dropper: My Life Leading Up to John Lennon's Last Interview," and it's my memoir, the story of my early radio-related life and career wrapped around what sadly tragically turned out to be john's last day on the planet december 8th 1980 which is when i co-conducted the rko radio with him uh, interview with him and yoko at the dakota mere hours before he was shot and killed which made that something i still consider to be the best and worst day of my life Mm. and my book features details and quotes from that interview, as well as so many others, plus plenty of sex and drugs and rock and roll. (laughs) And it will be released this year on December 8th, the 43rd Mm -hmm. anniversary. Can't believe it either, you know. (laughs) It's still tough. I mean, uh, let me ask you this, and then we'll talk about the book again. Um, When the music came out, Double Fantasy, in all those songs, could you or can you now listen to them after all the events? Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I listened to it this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> just just to, um, to, to bring it back up in my mind and to realize, once again, what, what John and Yoko talked about, which was that it was a dialogue. It yeah. was John singing, then Yoko singing, then John singing, then Yoko singing, because that's how they wrote the songs, you know, right. John came up with something, played it for Yoko. Yoko reacted by writing a response and it went back and forth like that. Yeah. And that's what made it so beautiful because as they told us, both of them, what they wanted to do was make it clear that men and women had to have a dialogue to get into the 80s, to mm-hmm. get back together and improve their relationships because mm-hmm. that's exactly what John and Yoko were doing. They were improving their relationships, the relationship that they'd had the past five years um, following what they called the lost weekend, Mm -hmm. their their separation for 18 months, which John said was the most miserable period of his life, Mm -hmm. being being separated from her. Yeah. As for myself, the only reason I ask is uh, I had difficulties listening to Double Fantasy probably for about five or six years after he passed. I mean, if the song came out on the radio, I'd listen to it. But I mean, it's like the the album just sat on my shelf and I played other stuff. I could play other John Lennon albums, just that one, because just that memory. And I wasn't even there. You know, you have a closer connection to it in, in a certain way. So that's why I was asking that. Um, one thing I did for my homework on this, since I, in lieu of having your book in front of me, is I actually listened to the interview itself, because fortunately, with today's technology of YouTube, it's right there. So uh, last night I spent listening to the interview again, which I've listened to quite a few times, but not in recent times. So, you know, I was taking like little notes. Um, and it is remarkable, even though you weren't supposed to talk about Beatles, talked about the Beatles a lot. <laughs> he did talk about family and Sean and things like that a lot. Um but yeah, he he brought up all the things that supposedly you weren't supposed to talk about, you know, uh, older albums and things like that, and his past, and yeah, it was all 
all discussed, which is made for a remarkable interview, actually. So kudos to you and Dave and all the others. So Super cool. It was a wonderful interview, but I would like to tell you that what's on YouTube is not the official RKO interview. It's always missing something. It's always slightly yeah. less quality, but, um, but you get the general idea. Right. And that was my question. I said, how long was the full interview versus what generally you hear? I've heard different lengths over the years. In fact, I've heard versions that are so cut up people have added sound effects maybe it was rko that did it or something like that you know and I get, so what is the full length and what was it condensed down to generally well what you might have heard from rko because the only thing that they officially released was this special that i wrote yeah. following john lennon's passing yeah. which mm -hmm. aired about five days later called yeah. which i titled john lennon the man the memory mm -hmm. and dave Shulman voiced that and it aired on the Sunday following the Monday where he was shot and killed. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a three-hour special. Mm -hmm. um, the interview itself was um, just about three hours. And we we spent a lot of time with them because even after the tape was turned off, we were talking about everything and <laughs> made plans to get together in a couple weeks in San Francisco, which was so exciting because I felt like I'd made friends. I'd made lifetime friends. And it was great because during the interview, every time John would say something or Yoko would say something that I totally connected to, it mm -hmm. just made me feel like, oh, we've got so much in common. Of mm -hmm. course, we're going to be friends. It was, mm -hmm. it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, which leads me to one of my questions, and I'll just ask you now. There's no rhyme or reason of how I ask questions, but um, uh, did you have any official plans to do follow-up interviews? Like the Playboy interview, it seemed like that was done over successive days and weeks. It wasn't just one session. So was there any more planned with John or Yoko or no at that time? Well, it's funny. We joked, John and I, because um, he was sitting next to me the whole time on the love seat mm -hmm. in in the uh, the private office, and um, and I said to him, "Wow, this has been such a great interview." And he goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was really terrific." And I said, "Cool. Same time tomorrow." And he <laughs> laughed and, <laughs> and uh, said that he couldn't wait to hear it. So I was absolutely sure that there would be follow up interviews. And I was sure that I would be seeing them again, you know, not not just the one dinner plan that we all made together, but um, but that, like I said, we'd be getting together and and have friendships and and um, specials, and mm -hmm. there was going to be a lot more. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you set up the 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 interview itself from the standpoint of? Sometimes you would ask a question. Sometimes Dave asked a question. I mean, did you take turns or did you have your notes ahead, like I do, ahead of time? And you know, it's like you just kind of signal to each other. You ask one now or how did it work? Well, one of the reasons that um, Dave wanted me to do interviews either for him or with him was because I was a newscaster and mm -hmm. reporter and came up with questions, with good questions. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea is on our flight over that one of the reasons why I was reading the interview that was in Playboy was to come up with proper questions and mm -hmm. great questions. So I came up with with the bulk of them and uh, and had them in the, in the night before the interview, um, Dave and, and Ron and um, Bert and I all sat up in our uh, one of our hotel rooms at the plaza and uh, and talked about the questions and and I had lists and everything and and came up with that and so we were all ready to go the next day Dave and I and and even Bert asked a couple of questions as well mm. so um, especially about kids because Bert was the one of us that that had children like uh, like John of course and, and Yoko had Sean um so that was his major concern pretty much and um and so that was the way it was it was amazing because what I wanted to do and what Dave wanted to do was each of us give each other the opportunity to ask what was the most important to us and for me it was coming back to doing music. How did that come about? Yeah. And so that was really wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to do that and to get his great reaction. He had so many funny things to say about that. Um, for example, um, when when I said, um, 
you know, I want to ask you about getting the urge to make music again. John burst in with his super loud, funny, and affectionate reply. Oh, it came over me all of a sudden, love. I don't know what came over me. And then everyone laughed. And while I reacted confidently to his endearing response, and I said, I know, it was like you were possessed. And he said, I was possessed by the rock and roll devil, you know, <laughs> and laughed again. We all laughed. And um, and then he, he added uh, a minute or two later, just suddenly I had like, if you'll pardon the expression, diarrhea <laughs> of creativity. And to hear John Lennon talk about coming back to make Devil's Fantasy as a diarrhea of creativity mm. was so funny to me. And it made me it's realize yeah. it was going to be the most amazing interview I'd ever <laughs> been part of in my entire life. And it was. Wow. <laughs> Um, how was the interview recorded? What type of technology did you use back then? Well, actually, for the first time, Ron was recording on a cassette machine. Hmm. For a big interview that we did. He'd been recording on reel to reel mm -hmm. for for the other interviews, including um, Paul McCartney. Um, but um, but this was on a on a cassette machine. And although it was good quality, we did have some tape issues and had to change tapes a lot and um that's one reason that what what you hear on youtube is is not always the always the greatest because they didn't right. have the uh the final pieces yeah so, i think the one i listened to last night was just a random one that said i think it was actually on dave Sholin's website the one linked there so that's where i went through that and then it's on youtube but um there was a couple dropouts and stuff like that on sound but um uh, you know it, i i was just kind of trying to get the gist of it i wasn't listening to listening for pristine audio quality necessarily i just wanted to make sure to refresh myself because you know like i said i remember that diarrhea quote i remember a few others you know where he goes vim and vigor you know and things like that you know it's like mm -hmm. they just stick in your mind he was just so animated that day is incredible you know so <laughs> such an amazing sense of humor mm -hmm. and one of the funny things um that uh, actually dave uh and uh, and bert were asking him about was um what he did on a daily basis his average oh, yeah. and and raising uh sean and that was more their topic because as i mentioned bert had a son young son about sean's age and dave was thinking about having kids but because i was raised by a dysfunctional family i had no desire to have children so <laughs> i like kids it wasn't something that i was thinking of doing myself right. so um what did make me laugh, though, was when John would talk about how raising Sean, he would sit and watch cartoons and, and shows with him, but he wouldn't let him watch commercials. Right. <laughs> they asked why. And and John said, because all they talk about is junk food. And yeah. Sugar, 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 sugar. And when yes. it's not sugar, 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 it's hamburger, cheeseburger, hamburger, hamburger cheeseburger. cheeseburger. Yeah. And and this just made me laugh so much. It was <laughs> it was John and his great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, because I had forgotten that part when you know until I listened to it again, and it's like, oh, what's what? No commercials because I know there is a quote somewhere, and he actually talked about it later in the interview that. You know, at, at one point he said, you know, I, I would love to write commercial jingles. I think those are great. And now he's preventing his son from listening or watching. And I, I get it. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, then I have to deal with that. Now I have to take him to McDonald's or wherever. I got it. You know, it's like, you know, so it's interesting, you know. Well, John did say that he really thought commercials were made so much better than movies and everything right was. and i thought that was wonderful and years later when i started doing promos and commercials myself that's what i would think of is i'm doing this for john lennon I <laughs> hamburger cheeseburger I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't do hamburger cheeseburger commercials, <laughs> but, but uh tv show promos and and commercials and and i thought about john all the time when i did them right one thing i find amazing about that particular day december 8th 1980 is we know just as general people and fans everything that went on that day which is really kind of scary <laughs> you know i mean you can't necessarily do that in every day in in the life of john lennon or any of the beatles or something but that particular day i always was 
fascinating. And I had to piece it together because it wasn't in books originally. Because uh, I said, wait a minute, he he got up, he had breakfast, uh, he had some photos with Annie Leibovitz, uh, he got a haircut, he did the interviews with you, and he did some recording and other stuff, you know, and it's like, this is such a planned out weird day to be the final day, you know, of someone's life, you know, and it's like, it just astonished me when I figured that out. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. And what really freaks it out to me is I felt guilty for the past 43 years, and I will continue for my entire life because of taking part in it for being the reason that John and Yoko were still in New York that day because they had planned to be in Hawaii mm -hmm. and on the West Coast and changed their plans to that part I did not schedule know. No. our day. But the, but the thing is, is the reason that plans were changed and that day was chosen, one of the reasons anyway, is um, before we set up the interview, um, Yoko apparently had been dealing with her astrologer, her personal astrologer. Mm -hmm. And we were called to find out our birth dates, our time of birth, mm -hmm questions about us personally because they were going to be used to determine what would be the best time and day to set up the interview and for some reason with all that information December 8th 1980 was chosen which mm. is really weird when I think about it and it made me feel guilty for being born when I was the time the day <laughs> not only that yeah. um but but all of the rest of us interesting you know? and, yeah. and it's it's horrifying to think that had had that not happened that that john would have been safe i mean the the asshole who who turned out to be the freaky assassin probably would have found him another day in another place anyway but mm. still it it still it was one of the reasons i felt extremely guilty and the other reason i felt extremely guilty as you may or may not know was the contact that i had that i had with that freak yeah that part i knew from based who, on reviews of your book already yeah yeah and it was just horrifying to think why didn't i report him to the security mm -hmm. people there at the dakota you know who might have called the cops and if the cops had come maybe they would have seen the gun in that guy's pocket right. and been able to get rid of him you know but um Unfortunately, that never yeah. happened, and that's why I still feel guilt to this day. That's too bad, but I completely understand. So, <laughs> um, let me see. Uh, on that day, though, um, since, like I said, it was a pretty packed day, uh, did you overlap? So, like, did you encounter Annie Leibovitz and the photographers and everything like that? That's funny that you had mentioned that. I didn't encounter Annie Leibovitz. And the huh. reason that I'm happy about that is because, as I write about in my book, I had had a terrible experience with Annie Leibovitz myself the year before Ooh. when I was a newscaster in Seattle, <laughs> which is in my book. Um, I had been approached by her uh, by a publicist um, she was doing a, a lecture for her show at the University of Washington, and they said, oh, Lori, can you please come to the lecture and then afterwards interview Annie and run it on your newscast the next day so we'll have a lot of people coming to her show. And I said, mm -hmm. well, gee, I have to be on the air, you know, and at, at work before 5 a.m. It would be hard for me to stay up that night. And they said, oh, please and I said, okay. So I went that night, Annie Leibovitz did a really long lecture and discussion. <laughs> and afterwards I went up to her and said, okay, let's do our interview quick. And she said, interview? And I said, yes, I'm on King Radio. And she said, why would anybody pick a photographer to do a radio interview? Like I was lying to her. And she basically told me to get lost. And wow. I was horrified and I said, goodbye. And that was it. And then <laughs> a year later, when, or so, or just over a year later, when I heard that um, that John and Yoko were with, with Annie Leibovitz, I thought, oh my God, please don't have her come down here because I'm going to have to insult her just like she insulted <laughs> me. And thank God she didn't come down. So, mm. uh, so it was, uh, it wasn't uh, effective at all on, on my interview with John and Yoko. Very so good. that's a good thing. 
But wow. and I also have to say that her photographs of John and Yoko that day were amazing mm -hmm. and, um, you know, still incredibly memorable. And uh, so, you know, she's a wonderful photographer. We just didn't get along. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. um, after all this is uh, said and done and everything like that, have you ever had a chance to talk with Yoko again or Sean or anybody else involved uh, other than John, unfortunately? I wish, but no, because okay. as you can imagine, what I must be in Yoko's mind is a reminder of the most tragic day of her life. So I can understand that she would never want to. Okay. Fair enough on that too. I was just curious if she or you ever reached out even in consolation or anything like that, but you know, I, I totally um, understand too. <laughs> I did try early on, but I understood yeah. completely when I didn't yeah. get a response. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's understandable. And I still care deeply for her. And like I said, feel guilty mm -hmm. about having been the reason for them to be there. Mm -hmm. Now, with your uh, co-workers, do you still stay in touch with Dave and Bert and uh, uh, Ron? Or are they still Absolutely. all around? Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you ever commiserate or talk about this subject? Or is it kind of off topic <laughs> after all these years? Or <laughs> uh, No, we used to yearly talk about it mm -hmm. and, uh, and re-experience it together. And we've done specials together and been on shows together. And I, as a matter of fact, recently did a podcast with Dave as well. And we're looking at doing a documentary as well. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something that it's a very important part of, of all of our lives and major to all of us. So we'll always be closely linked because of that. Mm -hmm. And did you interview any of them for this present book, just to kind of get their perspective on things or did you already know it <laughs> well i i did know it but of course you know being getting older and having memory issues <laughs> and not being a diary person at all mm -hmm. i did have to ask a couple of questions you know about how oh what was that and do you remember this or what was the name of the hotel that we stayed at or something like that you know so they were um very helpful mm -hmm. and one thing i do know about the book is you you, you Obviously, since it's called Rock and Roll Name Dropper, you don't just talk about John Lennon. And one thing, if you can enlighten me, since I haven't read it yet, but I'm kind of curious. Um, uh, I understand you put Mick Jagger on hold once. Uh, could you tell us about that? Yes, I did put Mick <laughs> okay. Jagger on hold uh, before we before our interview. We were doing a phone interview uh, for the special that I was writing, Top 100 of the 70s. Okay. And... Um, I was so excited. And the funny thing was, uh, I had a number of interviews on the phone scheduled and uh, a lot of them didn't, they, I wasn't told exactly when they'd be calling or if I'd be calling them. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden I would get uh, paged by the, um, by, by the, uh, the uh, front office person at KFRC saying, uh, Lori Kay, Mick Jagger's on the phone. And I'd say, oh yeah, right, sure. And think it was phony. <laughs> and I'd pick up the phone and say, yeah, what? And it turned out, of course, it was Mick Jagger and it was amazing. And um, and uh, Mick said, you know, well, I'm, I'm ready to do the interview. And I said, well, terrific, except I'm about to go on the air. I have a newscast <laughs> in less than two minutes. And uh, I said, do you want me to call you back? And he said, no, I'll hold, I'll listen to it. And I was so excited. But on the other hand, I thought, oh my God, I'm so nervous. Mick Jagger is going to be listening to my newscast. And even <laughs> though it was a, a short newscast, I was still, like I said, very nervous and I uh, <laughs> did it. And then um, came back on afterwards and Mick was so complimentary saying, wow, that was great. And I thought, <laughs> gee, He's in New York, but he was interested in hearing me talk about San Francisco and, and national news. That was that was really cool to hear him be so complimentary. And uh, and then we had a wonderful conversation and I got to tell him the most exciting thing, which was how in high school, when I got to see the Stones for the very first time uh, at the um, the Nicaragua benefit that they did at the forum here in Los Angeles. Um, and I got to tell him how I won tickets to that, that concert. So it was so very exciting. And, uh, and he was thrilled. 
very cool. <laughs> and tell me a little bit, since I'm a Beatles fan, um, you mentioned that you interviewed Paul and Linda. Uh, what was that uh, reason? Was it a current album or something like that? What was the reason for you interviewing them? Well, they had uh, just come with the latest version of Wings, uh, the, the new uh, band members. And um, Denny Lane was at the interview and he, he was, he'd been with them since the beginning with Wings right. and then two, two new members. And, um, and uh, Paul also had an incredible sense of humor as did Linda. And Paul was also very loving and, and sweet and sang and kissed me. And it was just, it was, it was incredible. And uh, at one point he asked me, he said, do you have um, Linda's book that was released, her first book of photographs? And I said, no, I haven't gotten it yet. And he got up and he ran to the back room and brought me out a copy. And he and Linda both autographed it. Wow. And it was it was incredible. And it was a wonderful interview, too. And um, another amazing thing that I write about in my book is <laughs> getting to smoke pot with Paul and Linda. <laughs> wow. And the band, all of us did. <laughs> and uh, it was it was another thing that, that I felt great about and, and felt that I'd made friends. Mm -hmm. And that was why it was also very sad when, when Linda died years right. later, it was tragic. Mm -hmm. At least some of these people like Mick and Paul are still with us, but yeah, time keeps going. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are some of the other people, you don't have to go into stories with each one of them, but I mean, other uh, drop some rock and roll names <laughs> as, the, as the title of the book. But Peter Bowie. Mm -hmm. One of my all-time faves um, was another top 100 of the 70s interview and getting to speak with him and tell him about seeing him um, Ziggy Stardust concert and, and how exciting it was because it was one where he had started to do songs that he had just recorded for Aladdin Sane. So I got to hear my favorite David Bowie song for the very first time uh, and fell in love with it, which was Gene Genie. <laughs> and he was thrilled to hear that. So that was great. And um, other wonderful interviews that I did uh, live at KFRC, the Ramones, my oh, yeah. favorite punk band. So cool. And Talking Heads, amazing interview. And um, uh, Little Richard, years oh. later when he came out with his um, autobiography, that was a wonderful interview. And uh, let's see, back at KFRC, um, uh, Jefferson Starship, uh, Paul Kantner, and Grace Slick, and uh, as I mentioned, George Martin, uh, producer of the Beatles, and so many more that I can't yep. even begin to remember almost, you know, and a lot of them uh, also uh, became uh, incredible uh, RKO radio specials, everything from Donna Summer to Stevie Wonder to you name it. It was great. And um, how many years did you work for KFRC or RKO? And are they the same length or is there a difference? Well, there's a difference because it was back and forth. Okay. Because when I started at KFRC, as I mentioned, I was an intern and then eventually got the job as news editor and reporter and wrote the uh, the Beatles special and a number of other specials. And what, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to be on the air as a newscaster, a major newscaster at KFRC. And the um, program director at the time, Les Garland, wonderful man, said, well, you know, KFRC is basically the number one top 40 station in the country. So somebody who's never been on the air as a newscaster can't <laughs> do their first time here. You have to go somewhere else, get started, and then come back. And I said, <laughs> oh, no. And he said, but don't worry. I'll help you get a job at a great station, and I'll bring you back within six months. And I said, okay, great. Thinking, yeah, somewhere else in California, that's fine. But what he did was he got me a job at a major top 40 station, WOW, in Omaha, Nebraska, hey. which had been, um, you know, a major station and 50,000 watts and huge. Um, but I didn't want to go to the Midwest. I was a <laughs> California gal, yeah. but I did anyway. And um, thinking, okay, I'll only be here. I'll only have to be here for six months. And I was there for 
less than three hours. And I was already thinking, oh my God, I got to get out of here. It was the <laughs> most freezing cold oh, um, uh, winter in well over 30 years. And I hadn't experienced snow at all. And suddenly there was snow up higher than my knees and I couldn't even walk on it. And I certainly couldn't drive in it. And so I was freaking out. And, you know, luckily, Les Garland got me another job less than five weeks later in Seattle, Washington at King AM, which was another huge top 40 station. And I loved it there. I was there for well over a year. And that was great. Um, I wasn't in such a hurry to come back, actually, to KFRC. But out of the blue one day, Dave Sholin called me and said, so Lori, what do you think? Would you be interested in coming to London with me and interviewing Paul and Linda McCartney? And I said, let me quit my job. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. And yeah. uh, I did. And I came back. And um, we went to London uh, with Ron Hummel and, and interviewed uh, Paul, Linda, and Wings. And then I came back and I was um, put on KFRC as an on-air newscaster, which was so exciting. And I did that along with tons of other rock radio specials. And it was really great. The unfortunate thing was that Les Garland had left by that point and gone on to MTV mm. in, in New York. And there was a new program director whose name I won't mention, who was <laughs> not very popular. And uh, we didn't really care for each other. And uh, as much as I loved being at KFRC and the people there and and everything, um, I just I just wasn't as thrilled as I had been. So when I got a job offer from Drake Chenault, who mm -hmm. knew me from uh, co-producing Top 100 of the 70s, to come and write a new special that they were all excited about, um, and they offered me actually plenty more money than I was actually making on air as a union newscaster, I said, okay. And mm. I went back down south uh, to LA area and uh, and went to work for uh, for Drake Chenault, writing and uh, producing SATCON 1, which I wasn't thrilled about the idea. It was a big phony concert, <laughs> basically. Mm. Uh, we, it was taking um, recorded uh, music by tons of, of, uh, of musicians and bands and turning it into live music, you know, producing it, making it sound live, and and making it uh, be all over the uh, the uh, the world um, via satellite, supposedly. And um, it uh, turned out to be a popular show, a forty eight hour show. But uh, it, like I said, it wasn't my favorite idea. It was it was fun to do, but uh, but not really great. And while I was there, fortunately, I had. Um, uh, approval to uh, to also freelance for RKO and keep doing interviews. So when Dave called me and said, we're going to get to go to New York and interview John and Yoko for Double Fantasy, I said, let me know when I'm there, definitely. Cool. And left uh, Drake Chanel to do that. Hmm. And then um, post-1980, what were you involved with career-wise? Well, following the Lennon interview... I had already a number of RKO interviews set up, scheduled, that even though I didn't want to talk to anybody else at all after the Lennon tragedy, I still had to do, mm. unfortunately. Um, and they were good interviews and they made good specials. Neil Diamond and Barry Manilow. And uh, I did a Devo interview and, <laughs> and a, a bunch of others. And it was just, I still, I just didn't want to work in music anymore or radio because it just was breaking my heart as I was sitting in talking to people. It was hard for me to be positive like I usually was. So I stopped for a while and um, then I went to work for another company uh, called Creative Factor and did wrote a weekly show for them and then started doing a number of interviews and radio specials for them again and um, and got back into it. And uh, after a while, I thought, but I don't want to be on the air anymore. And mm. I, I had 
been uh, for this show that I was doing for them. So I um, I went to work for Dick Clark, writing <laughs> his weekly radio countdown show, which was really cool. And I also ghost wrote his syndicated newspaper column, his weekly <laughs> column. Cool. Which was really exciting because I got to be Dick Clark. I got to <laughs> as Dick Clark and write That's about funny. them as though Dick Clark were there. Everything from um, the US Festival in 1983 to um, oh, the amazing Talking Heads shoot for their incredible movie, which I went to mm-hmm. all uh, all the nights of, of the the shoot and it sat in the first row as though I were Dick Clark and and wrote about <laughs> his newspaper column and and it was it was really fun to do that and I worked for Dick Clark for for quite a while and then I decided no I need to be out of radio again and I went to New York to write a TV show um, and uh, and so I did that uh, for the USA Network and. Um, and did that for a while, and then moved back, and and came to uh, to work in TV and, mm-hmm. and video production um, back in LA. Mm-hmm. Did you find throughout your career that it was easy uh, getting new jobs and things like that? Because you always hear about you know it's it's been tougher for women and stuff like that. But you know it seems like you had you know not the most difficult time transitioning and moving around. But tell us your story on that. Well, I was very lucky and I had a lot of people who I didn't even barely have to mention their names because most people seem to know that I'd been at RKO and that I'd been with an incredible news director, Joe Interante, and with Dave Sholin and 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 Les Garland, program director. So so that was always really helpful. And then after Dick Clark, that was another amazing name and and um it was it was all very great and and the um the tv production companies that i was working for were also really good and and well known and and uh they recommended me a lot and you know what what became hard was quite frankly covid the pandemic when mm-hmm. production stopped and not only that but i was getting older so people didn't want to hire older people. And then there was no production anyway for quite a while. So although I did go back to work the, the second year of COVID, um, after that, it was extremely difficult because most mm-hmm. of the production company um, executives that, that I'd been working for retired after mm-hmm. the pandemic and their company shut down. So um, I really haven't worked very much in production since then and mm-hmm. probably won't because now I'm basically working on promoting and talking about my book and yeah. being excited about that and planning, um, you know, everything from, from um, signing and book launch events, uh, not just all over the country, but hopefully all over the world. I hope to go right. to, uh, to England and, and, um, and do Beetle Fests all over. So mm-hmm. we'll see, hopefully yeah. that'll happen. Was that slow down in your career in COVID and everything? The reason why? you started writing the book or were you planning to write the book anyway? Well, you know, I'd been planning to write a book ever since the John Lennon interview, because at the end of the interview, when he was signing the copy of Grapefruit, Yoko Ono's book that I brought with, he begged me to be able to sign it because he said, you know, I wrote the introduction and I said, yes, of course you can sign it along with Yoko. <laughs> and I thank no, him. And he no, said, <laughs> said, oh, it's my pleasure because I love, just like everybody else, getting books that I get signed by authors. And I said, well, when I come out with my book, you bet I'm going to sign it and send it to you. And he said, oh, great. And so immediately I thought, I can't wait to write my book and sign it for John. It's going to be incredible. <laughs> and so after that, when he was shot and killed, I didn't want to write my book because I couldn't sign it and give it to John. Mm-hmm. And plus, I felt so guilty. I couldn't even bring it in myself mentally to write the book and be honest and cool about it. And so I waited not just days or months, but decades. <laughs> so, And plus, I was so busy that I didn't have time to write the book. And my memory loss was, was hitting me. And so especially at 40 years when I decided, gee, it's time now or never to write the book, um, it was it was really difficult to even think of doing it, especially being busy working. So I didn't. And then when COVID hit and I wasn't working, I thought, 
okay, now's the time to really think about it and really start writing the book. And I did. Mm -hmm. and I wrote it, you know, full time for a year and then started working in production again. So I had to stop for a year. So coming back to finish it and finding a publisher, that was really difficult, but that was um, 2022. And I was lucky to find a good publisher, a traditional publisher, because I'm not the type of person who can self-publish. <laughs> it just yeah. wasn't anything that appealed to me. And, um, and uh, luckily they were, um, cool enough to say, okay, and we should release it on the anniversary, December 8th. Mm. And so I said, okay, let's do it. And that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, what is the name of the publisher? Is it Tucker DS Press? Is that the name of it? Or... Well, actually, or... the publisher is Fayetteville Mafia Press. Press. Okay. Okay. But they, um, they changed their website to Tucker for some okay. reason. And, uh, and that's one of the places that you can pre order it. Okay. as well as Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and just about every other bookstore has it on their, their website now. Uh, and, um, and that's very exciting because it's already doing quite well in terms of pre-order. So um, I'm, um, I'm really looking forward, hoping everybody that, that reads it, uh, whether they buy it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or wherever or not, will leave me review on, on one of those sites. And, and hopefully it'll be a glowing five-star review and that they'll like it. <laughs> Because what, what concerns me is it's not a book just about John or Paul or George or the Beatles or any other band in general. It's my memoir. It's about me. It's my life story wrapped around all of that. And I bring up music every step of the way. Mm -hmm. You know, even when I was a toddler, uh, I was listening and it was important to me. So hopefully people will be able to relate to that which mm. is very exciting. And, and the reviews that I've gotten so far um, from, um, from celebrities that have read the advanced copy that are actually on the, um, the back cover of the book, everybody from Chris France, from Talking Heads and um, Tom Tom Club to um, uh, Dave Sholin himself, no RKO mm. exactly. I mean, it's, it's just great to hear that they liked it and they appreciated all that. So Hopefully other people will too. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. I mean, uh, if it's anything like your past projects, like the Beatles specials and things like that, it should be a very good read, I would think. So, Well, thank uh, you. My publisher likes it. Okay. And, and as I said, the advanced readers uh, pretty much all have. So that's that's exciting to me. All right. Very good, Lori. Um, that's pretty much all the questions I had, but, you know, I didn't know if you want, had anything else to say about the book, but um, usually at this point at the uh, end of the show, uh, give you a chance to re-promote the book, the publisher, how can, how people can purchase it, uh, and if you're doing any personal appearances in the next few months that you want to uh, mention uh, that people can go see you and get signed. Thank you. Well, as I as I mentioned before, the book is called Confessions of a Rock and Roll Name Dropper, My Life Leading Up to John Lennon's Last Interview. And it's my memoir, the story of my early radio related life and career wrapped around not just the John Lennon interview, but so many others. And it was very exciting for me to write. And also, I like reading it myself. <laughs> so I go back and I read it. And people can pre-order it if they care to, um, and they can check it out and read more about it and pieces of it and um, my bio and, and stuff about it by going to the website, which is confessions of a rock and roll name dropper um, dot com. And uh, and there's all kinds of links uh, there uh, with um, everything from podcast to live reading that I've done and and that sort of thing and and uh, uh, links to where you can pre-order it and um, and that's really exciting for me to be able to provide that to people and um, and they can also check out um, me on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, you name it, Instagram. Uh, uh, I try and do as much social media as possible. Although to be honest, Facebook is is the one I do the most with uh, and. Um, it's just, it's great for me to be able to relate to people and to let them know 
my story and how important it was to me and the guilt that I felt all these years. It's, um, it helps me to be able to admit that. Mm -hmm. So well, I um, hope it was a cathartic experience for you that kind of helped ease the pain a little bit to get the words on the page. Well, you know, admitting it and talking about it definitely yep. helps ease the pain. Um, but like I said, I still feel guilt on my head and shoulders. Yeah. So, you know, I bet. <laughs> and then, uh, excuse me. Uh, and then uh, I know you said the book comes out in December, but I mean, any personal appearances coming up that you know about? signings or if you're going like on a book tour at Barnes and Noble or something like that? Well, the book comes out on December 8th, the 43rd mm -hmm. anniversary. And that is the day I'm doing the very first book launch and book signing at an incredible store here in LA on the Sunset Strip called Book Soup, which mm -hmm. is very well known to, to locals and, and people from out of town as well. So uh, I hopefully will find it to be packed and, and, uh, lots and lots of people and I'll be happy to sign the book and and uh, tell them about the interview and and uh, any questions they have be able to answer and um, it's it's going to be very exciting and uh, I'm hoping to schedule a number of other appearances but um, you know it being around the holidays it's hard for bookstores to um, to schedule them around then so um, so they're having me wait a lot of them in, until January, I'm guessing. And, um, and I yeah. will be appearing at, at book fests as well. Uh, excuse me, not book fest, beetle fests, beetle fest, yeah. <laughs> including, uh, uh, hopefully the one in New York that'll mm -hmm. be coming up. And then there's one, uh, a Beatles beach fest in Florida at the end of January that I'm hoping to be part of as well. And, um, and a Liverpool, uh, fest as well. So, um, you know, and all of these events are also going to be on the website, mm -hmm. which is confessions of a rock and roll named dot com. And uh, and so people can find out about the events there or follow me or be come a friends or check me out on Facebook because I I note those events uh, dates as well. Mm -hmm. Well, here's hoping that you have a very busy 2024 promoting your book and meeting the fans and uh I'll have to try to see if I can get down to LA to do the book soup one. That sounds interesting. I like that. So that would be super cool. And I hope to be doing something in um, Seattle because that was a big city for me being a newscaster mm -hmm. there. Right. And, um, and I'm hoping to be in Portland, Oregon, because I have a lot of friends there as well. And people who are interested in the book have been contacting me saying, Oh, please check out this store. And, you know, and if you have any suggestions or contacts, uh, that you think would be good for me to uh, to get a hold of and and reach out to and see if they're interested, please let me know. Okay, very good. And, Not just you, know, what I'm talking to. Listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, as for myself, if you do get up to Portland, I may go come up and see you there too because that's a lot closer than L.A. But you know, I can travel. So anyway, cool. <laughs> all right, Lori. Um, it was very good interviewing you today, and uh, you know, I'm looking very. Uh, um for much forward for the book you know i really want to get a copy and uh it was so know. cool to hear that you're from san francisco too and i don't know if you travel there every once in a while but i'm hoping to do a book launch there and signing okay. as well so okay. i'll let you know if i do okay i can make it down to san francisco i actually you know we're doing this in august so it's a little bit time before uh <laughs> uh december but i am going to california my dad still lives there in uh, the South Bay area, in the San Jose area. Um, I did grow up a little bit in LA area as well. So I'm familiar with KHJ more as a TV station, but I know it was a radio station as well, because my big time is when we moved back uh, to Northern California in 76. And then that's when I discovered Dr. Don Rose and music and everything. And just my whole world changed. So, <laughs> so Well, that's cool because I went to school at UC Santa Cruz. So I'm oh, yeah. hoping to do a, a signing there as well, because mm -hmm. one of the coolest chapters in my book, I think, is my time at Santa Cruz. All about Very that. Cool. So, and, uh, and one thing I should mention about my book, too, that I didn't, is that all the chapters are named after hit songs and favorite cool. songs of mine so um so that's going to be fun too to have people react to that very good okay well thank you again laurie for being a great guest 
looking forward to your book. I really want to read it now since, you know, we've discussed it. And, um, you know, we will talk soon. All right. And that wraps it up for another episode of Fun Ideas Podcast. This is your host, Mark Arnold, and we will see you next time.